Hey, good day, everyone. We are glad to have you join us on yet another episode of the Yapa Voice webinar. How are you doing? It's been raining all morning here in Lagos, Nigeria. I don't know if it's rained where you are, but it has made the weather so beautiful, calm and relaxing. And so we are glad and happy to have you join us. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening from wherever it is that you're joining us from. This is another day to have quite a massive information about our mental health. And what we are talking about today, it's so, so germane to human functioning because we are looking at the issue of childhood trauma. Oh, before I run along, the medical director is here. The medical director and the higher head of the Yabo Voice, Dr. Olubenga Adekile who will formally welcome us formally to this webinar. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much, Dr. Mrs. Femi Akito Good afternoon, everyone from Federal Neuropsychiatric Hospital, Yaba, Lagos. I warmly welcome you to this month's edition of webinar by Yaba Voice. As you all know, Yaba Voice is a platform for mental health education, advocacy, and community outreach. It is a social media platform of Federal Neuropsychiatric Hospital Yaba Lagos, through which the hospital creates awareness and educates the populace on topical mental health issues. Today's topic, as you all know, we're in the month of May, and this month is devoted to for the children. Today's topic is on childhood trauma its implications and management. Childhood trauma can look very differently depending on the situation and the individual. But generally, childhood trauma is when a child experiences, witnesses or cares about any threatening or dangerous situation. When a child experiences trauma, it is imperative for parents or the caregivers to seek help, support for the child and to assess the impact and develop a support plan. Many children experience traumatic experience throughout their lifetimes. And according to Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, by the age of 16, more than 67% of children will have experienced at least one traumatic event in their lifetime. So in today's webinar, a lot of questions will be answered. For instance, what is childhood trauma? What experiences might be traumatic? How common is this? What are the signs and symptoms of traumatic stress in children? The impact of childhood trauma on such children will be explored and how to help children who have experienced trauma. To address these issues, our great mental health expert on this platform today. The first of the professional on the platform is Dr. Ade Tumbi of Mobala. Dr. Ade Tumbi is a child and adolescent mental health consultant. And an adult lover of children with over 15 years experience as a medical practitioner. She has been exceptional in providing counseling and medical aid to those who need it most. She currently works as a consultant psychiatrist in the Child and Adolescent Mental Health Unit of the Federal Neuropsychiatric Hospital here by Lagos where she offers specialized care, counseling, and medical evaluation to diagnose and treat children with a variety of mental health conditions. Our areas of interest in child and adolescent mental health include, but not limited to adolescence, drug addiction, pediatric neurodevelopment, emotional disorders, and well-being 
child psychology, among others. The second presenter on this platform today is Olurumke of Guinea Jazi. Okini is a certified and licensed clinical and abnormal psychologist. She obtained her first degree in psychology with honors from the prestigious Obafemi Aula University, Ilefe Oshun State, and back a master's of science degree in clinical and abnormal psychology from the University of South Wales, United Kingdom. Furtherance to our academic achievements, he is presently a doctoral candidate in clinical psychology at the Great Lagos State University, Ojo. She is a full member of the Nigerian Psychological Association, national, and the security of Lagos State chapter of the association. She's a member of the Nigerian Association of Clinical Psychologists, NACP, a local and international member of the International Society of Substance Use Professionals, ISO. Also a local and internationally certified employee assistant program professional. This is also an international member of the American Psychological Association, APA. Ms. Okini is also a member of the International Society of Ms. Okini is this, and a member of the Positive Psychology Association of Nigeria. I want to encourage you to kindly relax and listen to our mental expert as we promise you a rewarding session of today's summit. Over to you, uh, Mrs. Akito Yese. Thank you very, very much. Yeah. Thank you much. Thank you so very much, the medical director, for that arousing um, welcome. Um, he had initiated this conversation for us today, and he had also told us what to expect in this webinar today. Uh, please just sit back and get your pen, get your papers. If there are people that you need to inform about this webinar, please kindly tell them that the webinar had started. Again, it's important that we note that we're streaming live on Facebook. So you can if you're not able to join us on the Zoom, please head over to the uh, Facebook page of the Yabba Voice. Yabba Voice, one word. And then you will be able to listen to this live. All right. So, we have to run. We have so many things to talk about in this. Uh, Dr. Adetunbi is going to kickstart this conversation for us today. And um, she's going to be telling us what is childhood trauma and what are the causes. Childhood trauma and the causes. Because we need to understand this background to be able to move into this discussion proper. Over to you, Dr. Adetunbi. Thank you very much. Um, once again, good afternoon to the medical director and to all our listeners all over the globe. My name is Dr. Adetunbi. I'm a child and adolescent psychiatrist. And in addressing the topic today, childhood trauma, um, I would like to paint a brief scenario to, for us to delve into the topic as it were. Now, looking at our environment, we we are aware that we have a lot of parents training children in various ways, same ways to you know, bring them up in the best possible way. So, and because of this, children face a lot of, um, ex they have a lot of experiences, which um, are, could be beneficial or the, it could be deemed beneficial by the parents. However, may be traumatic to the child. So childhood trauma is any experience, any event, any circumstance that has the effects of damaging the normal developmental course of a child. So children develop in different spheres and different domains. They grow tall, they grow in weight, they also mature psychologically. So any experience a child has that has a potential of causing negative influence on, on this normal developmental trajectory is said to be 
a traumatic event. So let me give you some example. A child that um, the mother tells to go on the street, for example, to hawk granots. That child in the process of hawking granots could be knocked down by a commercial vehicle, for example. So that experience for that child has the potential of causing both physical damage to the child, social damage or emotional damage. So that, for example, is a form of trauma. So looking at that definition, any act at all, as long as it has the potential of affecting the child's physical development, social development, emotional development is a trauma or is a traumatic event. So what are the types of traumatic events? Traumatic event could be acute, meaning something that happens suddenly, unexpectedly, like a natural disaster, a fire accident, for example, a flood accident, those are traumatic events. If a child witnesses it can cause, you know, sequelae of trauma. Some traumatic events are chronic and long-term. For example, a child has been subjected to chronic neglect. The child is not being fed, or the child has an ongoing medical illness requiring constant hospitalizations, painful treatment. Those are forms of trauma to a child. Trauma could also be personal or interpersonal. So for example, in the case of sexual abuse, for example, that is between a child and maybe another older child or a child and an adult. So that involves a child and another person. Some traumatic events may be non-interpersonal, just between the child and the environment of the child or the experiences the child has. So a child, for example, who has a diagnosis of sickle cell anemia and has to go to hospital several times for injections, has bone crisis, several blood transfusion, those could be traumatic to that child, but those are non-interpersonal forms of trauma. So let's look at the various causes. Now there's physical trauma. Those are events or experiences arising from things like beating a child, eating a child. Those are things that can cause physical damage to the body of a child. It can cause trauma in forms of fractures, scars, you know, wounds and all of that. Another form of trauma, another cause of trauma is emotional trauma. And this arises when a child is made to feel or believe that he's not worth a person, or he feels belittled, he feels you know, low esteemed, he's not valued or he's not appreciated. Those are forms of emotional abuse. Another one could be sexual abuse, which involves sexual experiences a child could have, which includes things like on, on fondling, inappropriate search, you know, sexual penetration, all of these are causes of trauma to a young child. Some other forms include domestic abuse. Parents are fighting in the house constantly. They are abusing themselves, they are eating themselves, and a child gets to witness this. This can be a potential source of trauma for that child. So violence in the home is a cause of trauma to a child. Community violence, gang fights, cults, attacks, you know, unrest, terrorism, kidnaps, those are also community sources or community causes of trauma to a child. So all of these forms of trauma has long-term effects on the development of a child, both the physical development, the emotional development, the social development, and all of that. So these are, this is what trauma is, and these are some causes of trauma. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Dr. for that very clear and detailed explanation. And I hear us say that any event or circumstance that has negative impact, that has very negative impact on the life of a child, 
is what could be referred to as trauma or a traumatic event. And she went on to talk about the various causes that we have, taking from the physical trauma to the psychological trauma, emotional, and talk about the issue of the abuse. And so there are so many things that could cause traumatic events or experiences uh, in the life of, of a child. And this is what we are looking at today. Well, you know, funny enough, I was, I was just looking at it and I said to myself, aren't we all traumatized one way or the other because we all were the children you know everybody was a child once you no know, we, we we had all passed through the streets for adventure uh, some of the things that is happening in our lives as a result of the fact that we had been um, traumatized or we had similar um, traumatic experiences in the past and uh, mr jay is going to be talking to us currently now on what are the symptoms what are the indicators of traumatic experiences that uh, who we're able to say oh this individual has been traumatized so mr jay will be talking to us about that so that we all could know am i or am i not did i escape or i didn't escape over to you mr jay Good afternoon, um, everyone here. Thank you for having me on this platform today. So we are talking about um, the indicators of childhood trauma in children. And we all know that um, childhood trauma could affect people differently. And it should be noted that what affects one child might actually not affect another. And for some people, for some children, it affects their mental health significantly, while others do not develop such uh, mental health issues. They or uh, rather have some possible physical health conditions. So the effects of childhood trauma could also depend on the personality of a child as seen in their inherited traits from their parents, um, as seen in their strengths, as seen in their attitude to life, as seen in how they act and react with the environment, as seen in the resources that act as buffers for the material and financial state of the family. It could also be seen as um, from the support structure and the environment in which the child grew up in. So most of some children are able to recover from the traumatic and get assaulted. So some of the signs you would observe in some preschoolers, for example, and some um, elementary age children who experienced childhood trauma include one, attachment styles, these are affected. The majority of children who have experienced trauma have the faulty developing a strong LD attachment to their parents or to their caregivers. Um, while others have what we call um, separation anxiety, as seen in when they're anxious or when they, they feel insecure, when the parent or a caregiver is about to leave them, leave their environment. So you see them becoming extra um, clingy and you see some of them being um, looking for you to hug them more than usual. These could become even more pronounced after they had experienced a trauma. So due to this, um, there is inappropriate um, attachment and which makes them also prone to more stressful life events later on in life as they grow older. And then some of them also start to exhibit some old habits which they've outgrown. Um, some people, they, they go back to um, sulking, they go back to peeing and pulling on themselves. You notice this as teachers, as um, assistant teachers in school, you see some children, uh, you realize that, okay, at the age of, let's say, two and a half, three years, this child already stopped um, pulling on his or herself. But then, um, subsequently, probably around the age of four, you, you suddenly observe that they are, they are doing this all over again. And then you're wondering what happened, what is happening to this child? Then you start to ask questions. Some of them could also be overly sensitive. They could be overly sensitive to the moods of others, of others around them. Um, they're always watching out for adults around them, how they feel about them, how they behave towards them. So they're overly sensitive to the moods of others. Then you also can observe some of them being overly aware or vigilant. Then this is um, what we call hypervigilance. That is a child's way of saying, oh, look, there's harm around you. There's something that could hurt you around you. 
So they are highly alert and aware of their surroundings. So it, it, sometimes it could start from a feeling of, you know, impending doom. They start, they feel, they feel threatened. And then this um, is followed by a reminder of a previous trauma or threat to them. So sometimes this could lead to um, these children as they grow older, leading to feelings of distrust towards people around them, being suspicious of people, especially of adults, who they see as perpetrators of maybe um, examples of being the abusers, Dr. Dayton already talked about. Um, also, another sign would be difficulty falling asleep. Some of them would be unable, even when they initiated the sleep, they will be unable to maintain sleep. They'll be able, they'll be unable to sleep well. And then there's also increase in nightmares. You see them just suddenly hear them screaming in the middle of the night. What happened? Oh, they are having nightmares, possibly about the past traumatic events. And then some of them, you start seeing them weeping unexpectedly or excessively, or they are acting out, you know, something unusual for them, something out of their character. You just see them being angry you know, angry outbursts towards their peers in class or at home towards their siblings. And you're wondering what has happened to this child. Then something we call shifting moods, labile moods. It's this difficulty when there's inconsistency or there is an imbalance in their expressed emotions. Now they are happy. The next few minutes, they are either sad or they are weeping or they are acting out. Some of the things, are, some of those things are or signs are the indicators that you see in preschoolers or in elementary age um, children. And some of them, you see them tuning out. You know, they are known to traits in their environment. Even as teenagers, then with the emotional response, it could be unpredictable, explosive, they are angry, and then they subsequently become aggressive towards people around them. You just see this as a difference to who this child or this teen was initially. Then sometimes they withhold their emotions from others. They never let them see when they are afraid or when they are sad or angry because they see that, oh, if I let people see my emotions, they consider me vulnerable and then they can see me as powerless and then they can attack me. Okay, that is for children who are growing up in possibly physical or emotionally threatening environments. And all of those things could also affect them. In school, then you, you see there's a, a marked decline in their academic performance. They are unable to, to concentrate in school. They are unable to take note of what the teacher is saying. So all of these things could lead to or they could indicate that oh that this child has possibly undergone or experienced a traumatic event thank you mm. Mm. well this is very huge you know what was written out i said saying to myself you know sometimes when you see a child poo a child that wasn't pooing before had stopped and the child all of a sudden start pooing sometimes we would, we would beat the child we, as it will beat that nonsense that's usually what we tell ourselves. We'll beat that nonsense out of that child. Adventure. That child had gone through a traumatic experience and is reacting the only way the child knows how to react. This is very informative for us as individuals today because we must begin to be more observant, more vigilant, so that we can be able to help those children to be able to function and then to be able to do well adequately. There are a lot of things that she had read out, and I hope you have taken note of the salient indicators of childhood trauma in children, and which could also extend from that childhood late stage to, to teenage age, even to adulthood most times, because you find out that a whole lot of times, um, some of these individuals who have been traumatized as, as, as a child or as children um, who, who are not able to function as adults ever. But the little me is going to talk to us about the implication of childhood trauma. Uh, what in childhood? What are the implications of childhood trauma? Over to you, ma'am. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and I'm going to start off from where you stopped about the fact that the impact of childhood trauma is not only apparent in the child. It affects the child. It affects the child even as it grows up into an adolescent and into an adult. There are a lot of adults today that are not meeting their full potential 
because of the traumatic experiences they've had and the impact of those traumatic experiences on them now. So you see that it's important for us to talk about childhood trauma and know the implications so that we can chart a, a path to mitigate against this impact. Now, the impact of childhood trauma is not only on the brain. As mental health physicians, our primary organ of interest is the brain. But it does not affect the brain. It affects every part of that child, every physical and psychological part of the child. But let's talk about what happens to the brain of a child when the child has or experiences a traumatic event. So that little girl in your neighborhood, there is a domestic help, that eight-year-old, that you hear crying every night because she's been neglected, she's not had food, she's not had good shelter or good um, um, clothing. What are the likely impacts? What are the things going on in the brain of that child? Or a child that is in boarding house and every time they come home for holiday, is a struggle to get him back into the boarding house. He's crying and begging mommy and daddy not to return him back to school. Probably because there's something going on in the school environment that is traumatic for that child. So what goes on in the brain of that child? Now, the brain has a system that takes care of stress. That's excessive, chronic. This, this system may become overwhelmed such that it cannot do the natural God-given um, abilities that is supposed to do to prevent the effects of trauma. So there is a part of the brain that regulates stress, meaning when there is stress, it produces some stress hormones in particular quantity, cortisol, uh, adrenaline, norepinephrine, and all that. But once there's too much or constant stress, the brain is not able to regulate the quantity of these stress hormones. And once that happens, the brain becomes unnecessarily sensitive. Even things that we should consider not so stressful, the brain picks it as stress and start producing excess of these hormones. And we know that excess of everything is bad. For a developing child, the, those excessive amounts of stimulation has a, a negative feedback on the normal growth and development of the brain. So those kind of children, they may be unduly overactive. They can be very sensitive to fear and threats. You know, any, that's where you hear a child say, oh, because my friend called me a particular name. The child is withdrawn. The child cannot handle no matter the level of um, uh, insult or stress. So that could happen to the brain of a child that has been constantly stressed out or constantly traumatized. There's another part of the brain called the amygdala. The amygdala is the part of the brain that regulates emotion, emotions, emotion stimuli. But in a condition where there's excessive stress, this amygdala is not able to do its function. So there's a change in the appearance and the function of the amygdala. Amygdala cannot process emotion laden stimuli appropriately. And then there are a lot of you know, emotional dysregulation, aggression in that kind of a child. Other parts of the brain, like the prefrontal cortex, which is a part of the brain that regulates executive function. It helps children with planning. It helps children with processing thoughts. It helps children with, you know, from thinking concretely and being able to think abstractly. In a period of chronic stress, the prefrontal cortex does not develop as it should. And that is why you see a child that is like maybe 10 years or 11 years, still thinks concretely, cannot modulate between thoughts, does not understand simple concepts. This is the long-term effect of stress on the structure and the function of the brain. Some other neurotransmitters like growth hormone, for example, can be distorted, meaning it will not be produced in adequate number. So the child may not grow well, even physically. Those kind of children may be stunted. You see some children, they are not looking like their age, despite adequate food intake. This could also be a physical impact of trauma on the development of the brain. Now looking to other body structure, you know, we talked about trauma and the various forms that it comes in. 
So a child that is physically traumatized, always beaten for the littlest of um, offense, the child is beaten right, left, side, and center. Those children could have multiple scars. They could have injuries to their parts, or to different parts of the body. There was a, a situation some few years ago where a teacher was trying to discipline a child and in the process used a stick to eat the eye of the child and the child lost that eye. So that is also an implication. That is a consequence of trauma. So injuries like fractures, scars, bruises, all of those things are implications of um, trauma. Now going to the mental health conditions that may arise as a result of childhood trauma. Conditions like depression has been strongly linked to tra childhood trauma. Anxiety disorders of various forms, post-traumatic stress disorder, obsessive compulsive disorder, school refusal, social anxiety disorder. These are common mental health conditions that may arise because of childhood trauma. Also, children who have been sexually abused in childhood have a strong likelihood to develop even more serious mental health conditions as they grow old, older, even as um, substances, uh, substance abuse, for example, is strongly associated with childhood trauma, psychosis, and all of that. So these are some implications of childhood trauma. And not to forget psychosocial um, complications too. Some children have problems with social interaction because of the experience they had in childhood. They find it difficult to trust people because they feel the sense of being let down by the significant people in their lifetime as a child. A child who has always looked up to the parents, but the parents are now the source or the cause of trauma, trauma to the child. So the child grows up not trusting anybody, not having a deep sense of connection or friendship with people. And they grow up being lonely, isolated. And then this affects not only their functioning at work, it affects their relationships as, as a, even as parents, and then there's a vicious cycle of also traumatizing their own children or other people around them because of the experience that they've had in the past. Some other problems include things like poor academics. Some children are vibrant. They've been doing well in school. Probably when they started secondary school, they were doing well. They entered the boarding house, for example. By the time they get to GSS3, you find out that there is a sharp decline in their academics and you're wondering what is going on. This could be because of some experiences the child has been undergoing or ex been exposed to while in school. So this can affect the academic performance of a child. It can cause um, you know, tendency to indulge in substance because if a child is traumatized, there's an emotional pain that comes with trauma and the child tries to you know, find a, an outlet to let out this trauma, something to numb the pain. And some children get to use substance in a, in a bit to numb that emotional pain. And then that progresses and they have substance use problems or substance use addiction as they were. So sometimes these are some of the implications or problems that childhood trauma can have on the child as the child grows into adolescence and eventually into adulthood. So. Childhood trauma is very important because it can change the trajectory of the life course of that child. It can change the academic you know, pursuit, academic dream of that child. It can change the social life of that child. It can affect the other children within the neighborhood and the environment. Thank you very much. Honestly, I'm becoming very humble with this topic that we're talking about today. Um, um, you know, it's, 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 it's affecting me because I, I, as she was talking, I, I was picturing the people who are in the IDP camp. I don't know if you know, understand what I'm talking about. I'm looking at children who are under the bridge at Oshoji. I'm looking at the so many children who had been affected with, with this banditry, with the Boko Haram thing, with the so many things around the world now. I am looking at people who had gone, had to go through very serious traumatic events and there was no help. There was nothing, there was no, we, we, we didn't even talk about it. They didn't have opportunity of knowing that there's something like this. And so, you know, in our society, people will just assume that, excuse me, 
just it, it's over. It, you know, one thing we believe oftentimes that the person is a child. You know, there's this Yoruba way they say, and because of that, they expect the child to just move on without processing it, dealing with it, and every other thing. And you know, it, it comes to the fall that. How many people have been traumatized and are trying to cope yet they're not coping? And then we, we term it as they are lazy, they don't want to do anything, if it's a low dough, a dollar, you know. And you know, she talked about vicious circle when a parent, a child was traumatized, becomes an adult, now begins to, and then you now see it you know, going on in several homes and lives and families like that. This is huge, really, really huge. I don't know who needs to be here, but please, if you know somebody that needs to be here, a school administrator, a school proprietor, NGOs, organizations, please just reach out to them quickly. They can still meet up with something and they need to hear this because we must all do something to be able to impact our world positively. We are streaming live on Facebook, so they can also join back. And there will be recordings after, but please don't wait for a recording. Just hear it live. Thank you so very much. Mr. Guinea, how can we deal with this implication? Yeah huge well how can we deal with that okay so um <clears throat> excuse me so let's remember that children react to trauma in different ways and their feelings come and go in waves as a result of the traumatic events they've experienced so now the child may be moody and withdrawn at certain times frozen with grief at certain times and at other times they are afraid really frightened so there's no right or wrong way to actually feel after a traumatic event. So we don't need to try to detect what a child should be thinking or feeling when dealing with trauma. But to help them cope adequately, um, a child must have one, a good support structure. And this could come with what we call the um, family support. When a child has good family support, for preschoolers, for instance, you can use play. You know, they are playful, they are children and they need to play. Yes, they might be withdrawn, but at other times when possibly those fleeting moments when they forget about the trauma and they are now, they, they come out to play, you use this play to help them express their fears, encourage them to use artworks, even pretend plays among themselves to express what they may not be able to put to words. Then also, um, you can also use family time. This could serve as a security blanket for these children. You wrap them up in that family closeness, the father, the mom, the siblings, all coming around this child, whom you know has gone through a traumatic experience and make sure that they have lots of time or family time. Let's say for instance, these children who were who had gone through the, the trauma of being amongst bandits, you know, the Boko Haram issue that we've been talking about. And then they, these children are coming out, they, they, they went in as children, they are coming out as mothers with children from various fathers. They've gone through a whole lot. And then these children come back home. What do we do as a family? The, the family serves as a security blanket for them. You wrap them up. They might not want to talk to you immediately, but just give them time. Okay, over time, as they get to spend more time with you, um, you, you, you're, you're having them because you're talking to them. We, even about other things, later on, they get to start opening up about the trauma they experienced. Make sure the child has a place where he or she can call um, a safe zone. This could be at home or it could, even it could be the school for some children. For children who are elementary age, you can talk to them, the, those ones can talk and all. They can, you can talk to them when they have questions, even something unrelated to what they went through that might be close to it, answer them honestly with reassurances, including that includes simple statements to let them know that you are taking action to keep them safe, to take care of them, listen to their concerns, their fears. You know, when, when they wake up frightened with nightmares, they run to you and you're like, oh, you, you don't just chase them. Oh, it's nighttime, go and sleep. All your siblings are sleeping, you to go and sleep. 
No, it's not that. They want to talk to you, possibly about their nightmares. They want you to wrap them up in your arms, to show them love and care at that time. Just be there for them. Then you also need to limit the child's exposure to social media at this time. Sometimes it could be that um, it's being reported on social media um, what they went through. That's for the ones that um, the public gets to know about reduce their exposure to this, limit it, limit the amount of news about the situation that the child watches or listens to, even with adults around talking about the event. And then there's always the possibility when the child is overly exposed to such things that the child will misinterpret what he or she is seeing or hearing on the news. Yes, you don't need to hide what is happening to them, but neither do you need to overly expose them to constant stories, you know, that fill their, their fears about the traumatic event. So you need to check in on their understanding of what they're watching, okay, to really know that, okay, they are not taking it overly um, more than what it should be, or they are not misinterpreting. Then also you need to validate their concerns. Don't just say, oh, no, no, you, you don't have anything to worry about. Just, it has gone, it has gone. No, it, it's maybe related it, as in this traumatic event may bring up even unrelated fears and other issues the child might have been experiencing before the trauma. So you need to comfort them, making them feel that you understand and that you accept them for who they are, despite what has gone down, despite what has happened to them. So acknowledge their fears, even if they don't seem relevant to you at that time. Then be honest at all times with them. Don't, don't um, um, just say, oh, nothing is wrong. Everything will be fine and all that. No, validate their concerns and be honest. So for teens who are dealing with trauma, um, they may actually prefer talking to their friends because they are closer to them because they feel, oh, uh, it's an adult. They won't understand what I'm going through. They will just tell me nothing is, everything is fine. Don't worry, I'm dealing with it. But they need their friends. Some of them, for those who have friends amongst them, they would rather spend time with these friends than you. It could also be that they would prefer talking to outsiders, not within the family circle. That's within the nuclear family. It could be a family friend they want. It could be a teacher. Don't discourage them. Or it could be a religious figure that they feel would be important to talk to about what they've gone through at that time. So it doesn't have to be you all the time. And then I always encourage them to do their normal activities. If they feel, oh, they're not ready for it, don't force them. But if they are ready to also to, to engage in their normal activities they were into before the traumatic event, please encourage them. Encourage them to seek out their friends. Encourage them to go to, to engage in their sporting activities. Encourage them to engage in their hobbies that they used to enjoy before the event occurred. And also, do not forget to speak about the future and make plans together. This could help them counteract the common feeling that comes with trauma, um, with trauma amongst the children or amongst teens or even adults that have gone through a traumatic event. The future might look scary, bleak to them and unpredictable. But with you talking about the future and making plans with them, it gives them this rays of hope of what the new future would look like. So in the absence of a good family support, then teachers can come in, other caring adults could also come in to offer needed support to those individuals. Some of them might struggle with words. So therefore, as teachers, as carers, please encourage them to use play, to write in journals if they, there is need for um, excuse me, if there is need for that, or to draw out their, their expressions or their emotions in heart forms, all right? So understanding and reassurance is needed at all times, even until they get better and they're able to like live a normal life, not be angry at all times, not be sullen in class, concentrate again, and their academic performances improve. Then also allow them to grieve any losses. For some of them who were involved in this terrorism in Nigeria that we, we, we all know about, some of them have lost parents, they've lost siblings, friends, and so on. 
please do not stop them from grieving. Let them mourn their losses. Let them experience this and ill, okay, to be able to get over the event. And then discourage the child from obsessively relieving the traumatic event. Yes, continually they might dwell on it, they might replay the footage of it in their mind over and over and over. And this would overwhelm them. This would keep them in that place where they exhibit more of you know, depressive symptoms. But encourage activities that keeps their mind occupied so that they're not solely focused on this traumatic event. You could um, watch movies with them, you could take them to the cinema, you could just engage in activities that will take their mind off the event. And then always keep your promises. Some of the traumatic events um, they, they've gone through might be abusers, someone who had promised them something. And then all of a sudden, they experience the opposite with this adult. And they, they feel that, oh, no adult can keep their promises, all of them. I can never trust any adult. I can never put my, my life in the hands of any adult. To me, as in I can never lose control like that again. But by the time you keep your promises to them, it helps them rebuild their trust by making you seem trustworthy to them and be consistent and follow through on everything you tell them you're going to do. Thank you very much. What we need to do, you know. Sorry, you know, most times I just come and I start thinking. I said, How much? Okay, um, thank you so much, Mrs. Ajay, for that um, very elaborate um, information on how to we deal with these implications as you know, we have shared out this afternoon. And let me just to say that All right, we're so All right, very, we're so very okay. sorry about that. So so very sorry. sorry. Uh, the next one, one is launching. You know, you know, I said, I said it's where we started. That, that um, it was raining. It was raining this morning. So sometimes, you know, our network here works with weather. Okay. Uh, Mr. Guinea had told us very elaborately to talk to issues that has to do with um, how to take care. Uh, Dr. Adetumobi is going to, Adetumobi is going to tell us how do we now prevent this issue that we're talking about, we have seen that it's very prevalent in our environment. It's there. There's no running away. There's no hiding from that fact. But how do we subsequently prevent children from being traumatized? Is it even possible? Because, you know, some of us, while we're growing up, we're called names, different kinds of names. We were beating with them, um, you know, a whole lot of things like that. How can we subsequently prevent children from being traumatized? Over to you. Thank you very much. Yes, and that is a very important um, fact that a lot of adults today have actually been traumatized. But some, somehow, some people have been able to still pull through. And while some people are, are falling you know, in between the cracks, as I said, some adults today are, yes, adults, but they're actually functioning below expectation. They are not working in their full potential because of this. So it's, I know a lot of people might think, oh, it's a normal thing. We all experienced it as, as children and we've all grown up. We did not die. But death is actually a very relative thing now because 
we just don't want our children to grow up to survive the hardship of childhood. We want them to be mentally balanced. We want them to be able to be 100% productive to their society. We want them to be able to be the best version of themselves. So that is what we are about when it comes to child mental health. Now, how do we prevent childhood trauma and the implications of it? What do we need to do as individuals, as parents, as stakeholders? The first step is education about what trauma is and the implications of it. We need to start having these conversations everywhere we are in our cultural settings, in our religious groups, in our homes, because we have a lot of cultural practices that is entrenched within trauma. Some of the things we do on a day-to-day -day in the process of raising our children are quite traumatic. And let me give an example. There are some cultures where it is normal. When a child gets to certain ages, they send them out. As young as nine, 10 years old children, they are sent out to either work as house, house boys or house girls or to work on farms as laborers. It is seen as normal. But this is not the best for that child. The child should be in school. The child should be learning how to read and write, how to, you know, how to learn soft skills, even from the parents, vocational skills and all that. So we need to start talking to ourselves about abolishing some of our cultural practices that are quite traumatic. These children are given hard labor, things that are really not you know, in sync with their strengths and their mental capacity at those times. So we need to start talking about preventing these practices. Children walk on the road, despite lo local and national laws that protect children against slavery and all that. But we still see a lot of children on the streets, walking oranges, walking food. So these are quite traumatic. A lot of children are exposed to a lot of trauma, sexual abuse because they are walking on the street, physical abuse, and a lot of other problems. Some, in some cultures, children are used as collateral. Somebody needs money to cultivate his farm, goes to borrow money from somebody and use a child as a collateral. The child will be there till the child, the parents are able to pay. This is tantamount to slavery. So we need to start talking about those kind of behaviors in our cultures so that we can abolish it. In some schools, I'm aware that when children err or when they do something wrong, the school authorities call their parents to beat them in front of the school assembly. This is traumatic for, that, for any child. You know, so these are things we also need to start talking about within the confines of the school environment. What are the appropriate ways of disciplining children when they hear? What are the policies? Some parents just put children in schools because the school has a beautiful wall or has a beautiful name. What is the policy on discipline in that school? What is the policy on bullying in that school? Those are the things, those are the discussions we need to start having to prevent our children from being unnecessarily traumatized. You know, the anchor talked about name calling the other time. You know, children eh, and parents use a lot of derogatory names, derogatory terms that would keep ringing in the mind of that child till the child grows up. So those are things we need to start working on. Cultures, some cultures also, there's something called an anoresis dance or anoresis walk in some cultures. Children who bed wet, they gather all the other children and they sing, they embarrass the child. Things, are, things like that are not, they're actually counterproductive, they're not helpful for the development of the child. So we need to start talking about all of those things, provision of the basic needs of a child, giving them food. And that's why programs like the school feeding should be encouraged so that at least every child gets the basic things, food, shelter, clothing, those are the basic needs of a child. Now, having talked about this, other things we need to look at are policies that would prevent occurrences of some natural um, incidents or natural accidents that could be traumatic. You know, we said some are natural and acute. They are sudden. They are not planned for. Fire accidents are not planned for. A child could witness the loss of his or her parents in a fire. 
or the loss of their property in a fire, for example. So there should be policies on every um, sphere of governance to prevent or mitigate the occurrence of natural disasters like fire, like flood, like um, building collapse, road traffic accident, and all of that thing. These are multi-sectoral and multi-dimensional ways that we can use to prevent trauma in the long run. In the, the um, not, northern part of Nigeria, for example, where there's so much terrorism, kidnapping, and all of that, some other ways we can militate, militate against um, trauma will be to ensure that security is intact, children are not kidnapped. The, the um, children that were kidnapped from the school a few years ago, you know, you can imagine that kind of the trauma those children would have gone through, the trauma their friends left behind and parents could have gone through. So these are some of the things we can do. And for children who have, under, who have been traumatized, there must be systems in place to ensure that they have adequate social support, they are well counseled, their children that are relocating from one part of Nigeria to another part because of insurgency. What is the plan for those kind of children? How will they be followed up in schools and in the community to ensure that the effect of trauma on them is brought to the lowest and to the barest form possible? So I think with all of this stress management, you know, ensuring children have outlets to ventilate, you know, through play, through exercises. These are some steps that we can use to prevent the impact of stress in children. Thank you. Our time is running, 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 running. Thank you so very much. I know we don't have the information for our audience today, but again, we really don't have time. Uh, Mr. Dini was going to be talking to us very quickly on the tips of building resilience in children. Now we need to prepare them. Adversity challenges, stress, crises, quite a lot of things can happen at any time. How do we build resilience in children? Give us those tips so we can go home with them today. All right, thank you very much. Um, Dr. All right, to build the resilience, some of the tips we could use is one, um, making connections, teach the child the importance of engaging and connecting with his or her peers, especially in a safe environment where the child will feel very comfortable. I can also teach the child um, how to put him or herself in other people's shoes, as well as actively listening to others as these peers do for him or her. So building connections with others provides um, the social support and strengthens um, resilience in children. Then also help the child by having them help others. Some children will feel helpless, can feel empowered again, you know, based on the powerlessness they experienced during the trauma, they could feel empowered again by helping others. But some of us who engage in volunteer, active, um, volunteer activities, you will remember how fulfilled you are when you help others. So that is exactly the same thing you need the child to feel, Fe feeling um, fulfilled as a result of helping others works wonderfully for building resilience. Then maintaining daily routine. So stick to a routine that can be comforting so people, especially these younger children who crave structure in their lives, work with a child to develop a routine and I like times that are for schoolwork and for play and then for family time. So um, particularly during times of distress, you would need to be even more flexible with these routines. And then also teach, um, teach the child self-care. So the importance of basic self-care may be making them um, take more time to eat properly and get sufficient sleep. This also helps them to be able to bounce back easily from, um, from distressing um, situation around them that could remind them of a past traumatic event. Let them take breaks, let them have time for fun or participate in activities that they enjoy. So also nurture a positive self-view. Help this child remember ways he or she had successfully handled hardships in the past. Help them understand that this past challenges help build the strength of who they are now and to help them handle future challenges. Help them 
learn to trust themselves to solve problems and make appropriate decisions. Even at school, it could help a child see how his or her individual accomplishments contribute to the well-being of a class as a whole. You know, they have to together make a whole. So um, then help the child also accept change. Change can be really scary, even for adults. So among children, it's even more scarier. So help the child see that change is part of life and new goals can replace goals that have been unattainable. And it is also important to examine what is going on well with them and to have a plan of action of what is going well or not going well rather and uncontrollable. So point out how this can be changed into a different directions, into a different direction to earn or to replace the previously unattainable goal. Thank you very much. Thank you so very much, um, Sabine Ajayi for that. Look, there's a question here about the fact that yes, human action has been applied to post trauma in children. But what about um, trauma that arises as a result of medical status? Take, for example, seizure. How do you handle that? How do you help that child? You can imagine a child falling on assembly among other, other things and everybody laughing. So how do you, how do you help such a child? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, when I was um, talking, I talked about ongoing trauma that might arise as a result of medical care or medical treatments. For example, a child with sickle cell disorder or a child with seizure disorder as mentioned here. So that is traumatic to the child. The fact that the child, one, is using long-term medication, the child has to go to hospitals and sometimes miss classes, the, child, the fact that the child may be limited in some forms of plays or activities like the others, those could be traumatic for the child. So how do we help this child? Now, depending on the age of the child, we need to use age appropriate technique to explain to the child what actually is going on. The child must be told the diagnosis and the nature of the illness in a way that the child will understand. Now, the essence of this is so that the child will know that the need for me to use medication is not because I'm being punished or because there's something he or she has done aside for the siblings. So the child must be educated on the reason why she has some special routines apart from other children. Now, we also need to be realistic in, our, uh, in, our info in the information we dish out to this child. We should not say, okay, don't worry, you use this medication for six months, then you will stop. We must carry the child along in every decision making everything, every decision we make concerning the care of that child so that the child would you know, feel less of a burden that, okay, today they just said, I'm taking this injection. Tomorrow they said, I'm taking this blue medication. So we should find ways to mitigate the, the, the stress on that child. We should look for ways to you know, normalize some things for the child. Yes, you have this condition. It might not change soon. This is the way it's going to be. But if you take this medication this way, there is hope that these are the things we would achieve. So we are carrying the child along. We are explaining to the child the reason for those um, treatments and everything. And as the child grows up and matures more, you know, mentally, the child will be able to understand everything that has gone on when he was younger. And this also reduced the impact of trauma on that child. Thank you so very much, Dr. Adetunbi. I so very much agree with um, quite a lot of things that have been written on this platform. Uh, but yes, talking about the fact that yes, it is punish, it is discipline now, not punishment, because punishment is seen as punitive. But when you talk about discipline, you're correcting and instilling a new behavior um, into that child. Uzezi, thank you so very much. You said this is true. Trauma at any stage of one's life has to be processed and addressed. And um, at the way you said true, validating children's concern is a very great way of helping, helping them. And Tosta, thank you so very much. Um, Madam Caroline Obastori, you are always here. Thank you so very much for your wonderful response and kudos to the Arbor Voice team. Thank you so very much. We're happy to have you, Dr. Darabola. 
um, Malama de Darabala, thank you so very much also for being here. Olubinga Koka, thank you so much, Mrs. Adai. Child scripting, distress tolerance, and coping skills can never be overemphasized, especially since we know that children aren't born with this soft skill. So instilling them is also very important. Um, this number without a name says exactly the need to use medication continuously is not to be punished. Um, she became relaxed after she met a consultant who also suffered from this situation. They really helped to calm her down. Thank you so very, very much everyone for being on this call. We're going to take the last comment from our speakers and then we'll be calling it a wrap on this program uh, once again. Dr. Nitobi, your last word. Okay, my parting comments will be that as parents, we have been entrusted with lives, with destinies, with, you know, children that the outcome also rely a lot on what we do and the things we don't do. The aim is not just to have our children grow tall and strong. We also want them to be mentally strong, mentally balanced, so that they can achieve all their God-given potentials. Preventing trauma is a way to ensure that children grow up mentally balanced and also, you know, occupationally and socially balanced. So as parents, please let's take note of all these things and then let's do our best to ensure that we get the expected results. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Ms. Um, again. All right. Thank you so much um, once again. Um, so my last word would be, um, if after you managed your child with all of those tips, all of those management um, techniques we've outlined today, and you still see that the child is being affected, like their functionality, the way they function in school and at home is still being interfered with, please do not hesitate to seek out the expertise of qualified and licensed mental health experts who will help you identify triggers, develop coping strategies, and eventually decrease the symptoms that you can, or the signs that you can see in those children or in this um, individual who has gone through this um, trauma. So all in a safe and supportive environment. Thank you very much. Thank you so very much, um, Ms. Ajay. Uh, we so much appreciate you and everyone who have been on this call too with us today for this month's um, webinar. Um, please, if you know anyone who has been traumatized or you are traumatized and you know, see that these symptoms that we have talked about today are manifesting, you're trying, but yet it has a way of just showing things and affecting you. Please don't hesitate to call. For children, we have a child and adolescent unit at Oshodi. We have trained licensed professionals who are there to help and to help manage the situation appropriately. As adults, we have the adults unit here at Yaba, and they will be here to help you manage and navigate this. Please understand that to take a healthy adult, it takes a healthy child. And so when the child is traumatized, then the adulthood will be jeopardized. So we need to be able to watch out on all of those things, build resilience on our children, watch out that you are not even the object of, of the, it's causing them trauma in the life of those children. And when we do that, we will have a healthy environment, everywhere will live safely, and then we'll all have a balanced life. Um, until we come your way again again, please note that we are on Facebook, we are also on what Instagram, you can also watch the repeat episode on our YouTube page. Please just head there and watch any of the previous episodes too. This will also be uploaded shortly. So you can tell someone to tell someone to tell another person that we are there and we are doing what we know how to do best. And what we know how to do best is educating people on the issue of mental health. On behalf of the medical, medical director, director, once again, Dr. Dr. Lube 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 Lube. Lube. 
and every member of the Yabo Voices want to say thank you so very much for being on this call with us again. Until we come your way in June, where we'll be looking at the issue of substance, please stay safe, take care of yourself, and manage your mental health appropriately. Remember, there is no health without mental health. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye -bye.